Thank you, Joe, for the presentation. I would like to thank the uh, organizers behind the 34th SSAI Congress for the, giving us the possibility, possibility to orally present our fellowship, pro, uh, fellowship group project, which bears the title Web-Based Learning in Pediatric Anesthesia, an educational project from the uh, Scandinavian Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care Medicine, as well as the European Society for Pediatric Anesthesiology. Behind me, a drone picture and architectural drawings, as you have previously seen by Torsten, reveals the extensive remodeling Rhesus Hospital in Copenhagen is undergoing these years. A building process which within the next approximately seven years will also include a 60,000 square meter new children's hospital, as shown in the lower left corner, lower right corner of the screen. So uh, regarding this talk, I have no conflicts of interest. Web-based learning in pediatric anesthesia is a fellowship group project which has been established through an internautic collaboration. And before I continue this talk, I would like to thank the uh, fellowship course participants and our group mentor for the extensive amount of work which has been put into this project. So Dr. Karina Hobo from Aarhus University Hospital in Denmark, Dr. Hannah Foveus from Queen Celia Children's Hospital in Sweden, Dr. Steinon Haugstadtier from Karolinska University Hospital, Sweden, Myself and our study group mentor, who you just heard talk about safe touch, Dr. Torsten Lauritsen from Rhesus Hospital, Copenhagen, Denmark. During the next 20 minutes, my plan is to provide you with the background for our project. I'll introduce you to the concept of learning and e-learning, how we have applied it in our fellowship pediatric group project, and where we hope to be able to apply it in a future clinical setting. The Scandinavian Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care Medicine coordinates an advanced internautic education program in pediatric anesthesia and intensive care medicine. This fellowship program aims at physicians who recently have received the specialist degree in anesthesiology and intensive care medicine. And during this two-year fellowship program, the course participant will undertake several sub-elements as shown behind me and will be both clinically and theoretically evaluated. Learning is the act of acquiring new or modifying and reinforcing existing knowledge, behaviors, skills, values, or preferences which may lead to a potential change in behavior and how we process information relative to experience. As medical students and doctors and specialists, we've all been in the situation of having to acquire new knowledge in order to progress in our medical training. We have with no doubt all of us been taking power naps during university lectures, participated in problem-based learning and clinical simulations, and I dare not think of how many hours we've all spent on the internet in search of knowledge. As doctors, we constantly have to learn, evolve, and improve in order to provide the best quality for our patients. So how are we as European pediatric anesthesiologists performing on this level, and what is the best modality for acquiring new knowledge? To answer the first question, I'll refer to the Apricot study, which was published in Lancet in May this year, a prospective European multicenter observational study looking at the incidence of severe critical events in pediatric anesthesia. This study highlights a relatively high rate of severe critical events during the anesthesia management <coughs> of children for surgical or diagnostic procedures in Europe and shows a large variability in the practice of pediatric anesthesia. The authors concluded, among others, that these findings are substantial enough to warrant attention from national, regional, and specialist societies in order to target education of anesthesiologists and their teams and implement strategies for quality improvement in pediatric anesthesia. So in short, we can do better. In order to answer the second question, what is the best modality for acquiring new knowledge, we had to go see our best friend, Wikipedia. The subject of learning is in no way my field of expertise. Um, <clears throat> uh, the subject of learning is, no way, uh, is in no way my field of expertise, and the only thing I can assure you is that there is no simple answer to this question. Still, one of the key issues is that combining appropriate concurrent multimedia modalities, such as images, video, displaying text, and playing audio, seems to improve learning factors which are all key elements in the concept of e-learning. E-learning plays a prominent role in conventional education, adult education, and medical training because of its flexibility, broad resource sharing capacity, and because it's cost-effective. 
E-learning has become central to medical education, and web technologies offers valuable new opportunities for both under- and postgraduate medical education. E-learning also offers participants an advantage in that they can choose a comfortable and accessible place and time to study, which is important in particular in postgraduate medical education. The primary aim of this project was to establish an e-learning platform which is based on seven years of high-quality video congress material from the European Society of Pediatric Anesthesiology, also known as ESPA, peer-reviewed articles, case scenarios, and multiple-choice questionnaires. The secondary aim of this project was to establish a formal collaboration between ESPA and SSAI. In order to obtain our aims, we meticulously examined and categorized 250 ESPA Congress video presenta presentations varying from approximately 15 to 30 minutes in length. As much as I enjoy obtaining knowledge, I must admit that a relatively large amount of hot black coffee was needed during this process. Of the 250 ESPA Congress video presentations, 26 were chosen and included based on correlation and relevance to three topics of specific interest to the study group, being coagulation and transfusion, 11 videos, adverse respiratory events, 7 videos, and neurotoxicity, 8 videos. The educational material was uploaded and processed in an international e-learning platform called Easy Generator, which I'll get back to later. A platform which not only allows the presentation of educational material using various multimedia solutions, but which also allows specific functionalities of such as track and trace of the course participants' results, adding co-authors and distribution of courses through official websites, intranet, and learning management systems typically applied by large educational institutions. The courses were followingly accepted and reviewed by the presenters participating in the video sequences which were uploaded to the platform. So the results, three e-learning modules bearing the titles Coagulation and Transfusion, Adverse Respiratory Events, and Neurotoxicity have been created. Also, a formal collaboration between the board of directors at SSAI and ESPA has been established. During the next 10 to 15 minutes, I would like to introduce you to these three courses. They are all built on the same key elements, being an introduction, a section regarding objectives, a section regarding learning goals, followed by a combination of edited video sequences, multiple choice questions, and case scenarios. The first course I'd like to refer to bears the, bears the title Coagulation and Transfusion. When the course participant is first linked to the course, he or she is presented with the possibility of authorizing themselves using social media, such as Facebook, LinkedIn, or Google+. It's also possible to register using an email. In doing so, this al allows the course provider to, with the ability to track and trace the course participant's results. Should the course participant, for some reason, wish to review the content of the course, being anonymous, that's also possible. While the, pra <coughs> while the practice of transfusion of blood products to neonatal and pediatric patients has much in common with the transfusion of blood products to adults, there are several important differences and special circumstances to consider. With the making of this e-learning module, we aimed at introducing the course participant to an overall theoretical uh, understanding of the clinical and theoretical challenges in the perioperative setting of pediatric blood transfusion and coagulation management. When the course participant has registered, he or she is presented with a short introduction, objectives and learning goals, and now just to make sure only a part of the learning goals are shown in the screenshot. Then the course is started. An overview of the entire course is presented in the left-hand side of the screen. This allows the course participant to navigate back and forth in different sections if needed. The course participant is then presented with one of several video sequences which are relevant to the module of coagulation and transfusion. When the video sequence ends, the course participant is introduced to a number of multiple choice questions as shown in this picture. As you can see just below the ESPA and SSAI logo, which is located in the top of the screen, the course participant is able to continuously track the accumulated positive response rate. 
At the end of the transfusion and coagulation module, the participant is presented with a case scenario. This is meant to integrate knowledge obtained throughout the entire course. This exact case is about a five-month-old, 5.5-kilo baby with a primary diagnosis of biliary atresia. The patient is awaiting a liver transplantation and is currently undergoing a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt procedure, also known as the TIPS procedure. The next slide provides information regarding the anesthesia and paraclinical data which are meant to form the basis for future decisions of the course participant. The course participant is now faced with a relevant dilemma. The patient starts bleeding actively through the mouth, and decisions regarding coagulation management and transfusion strategy has to be made. In this particular case, three decisions can be made. The course participant can either choose transfusion of colloids or crystalloids, or alternatively await transfusion while obtaining for instance, a rotor assay. If one was to choose transfusion of colloids, the following response would appear. Even though it might seem obvious, an explanation to a correct or wrong answer is of great importance. This way, it is not just a statement, but a learning process that either reinforces or modifies existing knowledge. The participant is guided back to the main options. The correct option is chosen, and an explanation for this is provided. During the course, as well as at the end of the course, the participant will be able to continuously track their own progress by viewing the positive response rate. The course provider, on the other hand, is able to set a minimum limit in order to pass the course, for instance, an 80% positive response rate. Also, a built-in feature enables the course participant to continuously review the outcome of the answers. So this is during the course. The course participant can then focus on the problematic issues and is at the same time reinforced with regard to correct answers. Our second e-learning module, Adverse Respiratory Events, concerns one of the major events that causes morbidity and mortality in pediatric anesthesia. The objectives of this module is to introduce a course participant to an overall understanding of the clinical and theoretical challenges relating to larynco and bronchospasm during anesthesia. The course module consists of an introduction, objectives and learning goals, followed by a relevant video sequences, just as previously described for the coagulation and transfusion module. The video sequences are followed by multiple choice questions, which are meant to further enlighten the course participant of relevant issues related to adverse respiratory events. Finally, this e-learning module is ended with a case regarding a one-year-old child who develops laryngospasm while being extubated. Saturation is dropping fast, and the course participant is supposed to prioritize their next moves by ranking the text correctly. Luckily, I succeeded in doing that since I made the program. The third and final module, neurotoxicity, which we just heard talk about, is a, <coughs> is a predominantly theoretical module. The possibility of neurotoxicity during uneventful anesthetic procedures in human neonates or infants has led to serious questions about the safety of pediatric anesthesia. The objectives of this e-learning module is to introduce the course participant to an overall understanding of the theoretical challenges related to the subject of neurotoxicity as well as enable the course participant in obtaining sufficient knowledge to inform parents of small children undertaking anesthesia. The module is, as the previous courses, built on the same key elements, <clears throat> but differs a bit with regard to content due to the fact that it's primarily a theoretical subject. Nonetheless, it highlights a very important issue to both parents and caretakers. So looking into the future, so far we've been able to establish the foundation for an e-learning platform. We've established a formal collaboration between the European Society for Pediatric Anesthesiology and the Scandinavian Society for Anesthesiology and Intensive Care Medicine, and we will continue to expand an already existing national and international network of professional cooperation. On a Danish national level, we are already in the progress of developing new courses, which are not only theoretical minded, but also tutorial videos showing pediatric airway handling, trauma reception, insertion of central venous catheters, and much more. 
Also, we have applied the Danish Society for Anesthesia and Intensive Care Medicine, which is our specialist society, to consider the use of e-learning in the education of future anesthesiologists. As much as I enjoy talking about the advantages of a European-based e-learning platform, we also have to consider the possible drawbacks. An e-learning course provides an online assessment of a student which is limited to objective questions. One of the things I have experienced <coughs> is that the formulation of a multiple choice question or even a case scenario is in no way straightforward. The most serious disadvantage to the multiple choice question is the limited types of knowledge that can be assessed. Multiple choice tests are best adapted for testing well-defined or lower order skills. Problem solving and higher order reasoning skills should be tested using simulation-based training or in a supervised clinical setting. Therefore, we believe that, e that an e-learning platform should not be an alternative, but more an addition to the already existing educational modalities. One of the other disadvantages, or challenges if you like, is the continuous professional maintenance of an e-learning platform. As previously mentioned, we constantly evolve and improve Therefore, it's of great importance that such an e-learning platform is always up to date. Hence, an e-learning platform is not a one-man project. In order to obtain a common European understanding and provide an up-to-date e-learning platform, we have to focus on cooperation across national borders. This is why we have initiated a formal collaboration between ESPA and SSAI. So to conclude, Using high-quality Congress video material, as well as peer-to-peer -peer communication, we've been able to establish the foundation for a pediatric-based anesthesia e-learning platform. As previously mentioned, there are several advantages to this educational approach, such as cost effectiveness, providing user flexibility, instant resource sharing capacity, as well as being able to evaluate the theoretical skills of the course participants on a unique level. In a daily clinical setting, this could to some degree relieve the senior anesthetists in knowing that the students already have a common theoretical understanding before undertaking clinical work. In a larger perspective, the implementation of such a European-based pediatric e-learning platform could potentially lead to a more common way of providing anesthesia for our smallest patients, hence minimizing the variability in the practice of pediatric anesthesia. It is a possible way to target education of anesthesiologists and their teams in order to implement a strategy for quality improvement in pediatric anesthesia, as mentioned in the Apricot study. Thank you for listening. Okay, then, yeah, there's several microphones, so we have one question here concerning 12 months old. Is there an increased risk of anesthesia if the infant is light to age, less than 10 kilos, otherwise healthy? If you just put a marker on all the 10 ends, there shouldn't be any increased risk. But um, I guess handling a, a child of that age would require some uh, training. So if you have the training, there's no increased risk. But if you don't have the training, there would be an increased risk. Simple. Yeah, you can keep. E-learning box. <laughs> Is it open access? It's going to be an open access, yeah. Oh. So, yeah. 